everyone, and welcome to this new podcast series. My name is Patrick Tian. I'm a licensed clinical therapist specializing in childhood trauma. In what this podcast series will be focusing on, we're going to be focusing on people's individual's expressive stories, getting to the heart of the matter that what happened to us in our childhood. We're also going to be omitting a lot of clinical jargon and just focusing on the story, not the diagnosis. And we're also going to focus on the relationship recovery process, which is the model of childhood trauma therapy that I do. It was developed by Amanda Curtin, LICSW, and is also known as RRP. So let's get into this episode. So hello and welcome back to the series that I'm doing on what happens to men via their childhood trauma. And we'll be looking at the fascinating and complex life of John Lennon. But first, I'd like to get into a side story. (laughs) Um, I was actually introduced to the concept of therapy through John Lennon's music. And this was about when I was about 15 years old via a cassette tape that I found. When I would go into trips into Boston from the suburbs where I kind of grew up, where I started to kind of branch out and, you know, start listening to Bob Dylan and Smashing Pumpkins and it's the early 90s. So there's all this great music happening as well as kind of classical rock music going on. And I found the tape at a place called Nuggets in Kenmore Square, which I was really pleasantly surprised to find out that it's still there. This was a used tape and and vinyl place and CDs that you would just go around. There was also a... um, like an old army navy store, a pizza place, and a couple blocks away behind where these shops were is Fenway Park in Boston. Um, and one of the tapes that I actually came across was something called Shaved Fish, which was a best of at that point, released around 1975, of John Lennon's work. And I had a different looking tape, and the tape was more about what the album art looked like. So he's got all these great hits like, you know, Instant Karma, Cold Turkey mother imagine mind games and you know weirdly enough i wasn't a beatles fan i became a beatles fan much later in life and i had heard about john lennon and i obviously heard imagine and i think i heard instant karma on there was a nike commercial (laughs) um at the time around 1989 or 90 and i was like oh that's a neat song so i just kind of stumbled upon this tape and what drew me into it is that it had a fish on it And I was 15 years old and I was just getting into what it meant to be a Pisces. (laughs) So I'm trying to explain what my decision making was like of of my purchases, my musical purchases back then. It's all pretty innocent. So I picked up this tape, took it home from Kenmore Square. I was smoking cigarettes at the time and becoming that kind of kid. And I remember taking this tape all the way back home when I had this basement room. I started playing this tape and one of the songs on it is a tune called Mother. And if you're not familiar with that tune, just brace yourself for how powerful this is around childhood trauma and his experience. You know, some of the lyrics was, mother, you had me, but I never had you. I wanted you, you didn't want me. So I I just gotta tell you goodbye. And I'm definitely not doing the song justice. It's like, it's I, I even struggle sometimes listening to the song now Um, because it's just so primal, no pun intended, because John Lennon had just done some therapy around before the release of that. He wrote this song after a brief time he spent in something called primal scream therapy in early 1970, I believe. And Mother and you know had been released on an album later that year, and the therapy had such a powerful impact on him. He didn't spend very much time in it. So there I am, and I'm I'm listening to this song. Um, and it's like he wasn't, it's like he was speaking for me and he was naming something for me that uh, I probably had known my whole life at that point. I was again, 15 years old and he's naming childhood trauma through this song. He, I'll never forget that kind of moment. It was almost like a matrixy kind of moment where you kind of wake up and you realize, oh my God, this is, this is what has been going on the whole time right underneath my nose. So at 15, you might have a suspicion that you're going through something that isn't normal, but that song, along with now being a teenager with a deeper understanding of what was going on around me, and Lennon was telling me something about my parents that I that I kind of knew but didn't know. Six years later, I would start therapy working on the same issues that he would be experiencing in his childhood, as Lennon just kind of wrote out in this simple and very painful and primal language. And that moment was a gift to me through his music, 
about kind of waking up to something. And for many Beatles fans and people who know his story and are really into the Beatles and into the Beatles history, around the time of John Lennon's solo career and, and leading up into the breakup of the Beatles, there's a big chunk of dissonance in the man's life. It's like that common conundrum we have of separating the art from the artist. John Lennon created what is perhaps the world's most beloved band, the Beatles. He's an icon, he's a historical figure, both for his contribution to music, but also as a writer, as a public figure, as an activist, and his songwriting partnership with Paul McCartney is the most successful in history. It's hard actually to give a quick summary of the man's important contribution to art and culture. I have a lot of dissonance as a fan of given what I do as a therapist and who I am, and I'm always struggle with making sense about John Lennon. And you'd see clips of him just being wonderfully goofy, such as in the recent Beatles Get Back sessions released. His wit, his cool factor, and as we're watching Transfix and the Beatles create that album in the Get Back sessions, John Lennon had just walked out of his son Julian's life who was five at the time and who had already seen very little of his father. He was recreationally using heroin and now using heroin in a deeper way after years of pill use, amphetamine use, hallucinogenics, alcohol into excess. And in the Get Back sessions, he's kind of the skinnier, hairier beetle as opposed to the well-fed looking Ed Sullivan era beetle. The dissonance for many around Lennon's character, primarily as a father to his first child and then husband to Cynthia Lennon and kind of bandmate through the later years, and juxtaposed against his message of love and activism and advocacy for the marginalized, on one hand, he's writing Imagine, Give Peace a Chance. He was supporting the Black Power movement and the feminist movement of the late 60s and 70s, writing Power to the People, Instant Karma, Working Class Hero. And on the other hand, he's pretty much nearly disowning his first child, disrespecting his first wife, verbally eviscerating his former writing partner with songs like How Do You Sleep, is known for somewhat to have been a bully in childhood. In the last stages of the Beatles, he blows up his family life and his professional life, and it feels like he starts this long process of fighting everyone and everything while promoting peace. I see that as childhood trauma symptoms. And it goes on, you know, he was he, in LA during the last weekend, he was thrown out of a comedy club for drunkenness and heckling the Smothers Brothers during that last weekend. Um, he's also verbally abusive in the studio that you can see clips of to the engineers, to the producers. Back when the Beatles were coming up, he had beat up a Beatles friendly DJ when that DJ kind of made fun of his sexuality after hanging out with Brian Epstein like beat the man up, this is the early days. And the thing is, as humans and as childhood trauma survivors is, we wanna pick, we wanna pick, was he a self-actualized, progressive and creative icon, a hero? Or was he like a self-indulgent, self-righteous, rock royalty persona and very entitled? You know, with Lennon, it's like being in the most beautiful room you've ever been in. There's beautiful artwork. There's like life-affirming music that is just genius and it transcends things. And then you've got this like nefarious, huge, menacing trunk in the middle of this room with a whole bunch of bad vibes in it in the middle that's staying put. And you can't kind of make those two things work. I know that analogy kind of sounds out there. And maybe you have a parent like that or someone close to you like that or a family member that is sort of has all these amazing, wonderful qualities, but then just really has this dark quality to them. So what happened to John Lennon? You know, luckily we have a documented timeline of his childhood, given the, the cultural soap focused on this man, but it still doesn't fully add up kind of to the general public. And I'd like to give it an analysis and look at it correlating what happened to him in childhood and how he behaved as an adult. And I think we can have more like accountability or understanding or even compassion if we can make a deeper sense of what happens to men in their childhood. So let's now move on to something like in the last one I did around John Quincy Adams, let's pretend we have a time machine. So what if we had this time machine and we flip the dial to May 22nd, 1968 to a difficult scene in John Lennon's mansion at Kenwood in Weybridge, UK which is about an hour southwest of London, which was his residence with his wife, Cynthia Lennon, and son, Julian Lennon. And I'll try to describe this scene as I kind of read it 
and I'll let you connect with the emotions to it. You're going to be up and down, so maybe buckle in a little bit here. So May 22nd, 1968, Cynthia Lennon, John's first wife, mother to his child Julian, his first child, had come home from a trip to Greece with Beatles personnel. John had suggested she go there because he was about to start recording an album. And she came home a day early to try to connect with her husband who had for now for about two years had become more distant, had become more strange for different reasons, um, more fame, more drugs, specifically LSD through that period. And it should be noted that also the couple were really very different people. So Cynthia reported that the door of the the mansion was left wide open, the lights were all on, and it just didn't seem like anybody was home. And Cynthia had felt like she was losing her husband to the excess and already knew of an affair he was having. He confessed to it um, and had confessed to a lot of infidelity throughout those Beatle years and careers so far. So Cynthia had come home after trying to call him the day prior and found her husband with his new lover, Yoko Ono, in matching purple robes, and in a bizarre way, was very open that they were now together as a couple in front of her. They were very casual with it and being fine with it that John Lennon just kind of said, oh, hi, you know. And Cynthia tried to cut through the awkwardness by trying to make social plans with him, which he just said, no, thanks. And it isn't clear to me if Julian was present when this occurred, but she was accompanied by someone named Alex Madras, or AKA also known as Magic Alex, who I will come back to later, this Beatles kind of employee. And this was the end of their marriage in a new way of life for John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Cynthia and John would divorce. Their divorce would be finalized about six months later with Cynthia having full custody of Julian and John having visitation with that if he wanted that. There was a trust and a settlement that would become complicated for Julian later in life after Sean Lennon was born and a long legal battle started with Yoko Ono about fair distribution of the estate. So back to this moment in time, May 22nd, 1968. Here is some context to this moment of the Beatles phenomenon, kind of in bullet points of this moment that we're looking at. John Lennon for three years at this point was in probably daily drug use of harder substances, specifically LSD, and now moving into recreational heroin use. He was using drugs since the 1960s, starting in the Hamburg days, specifically those would have been pills in, in, in form of amphetamines. They were working long hours. It was just part of what they were doing back then. There is a paradigm of Beatles wholesomeness to the public. Like if you watch the anthology documentary series, that it was just creative LSD use and lots of marijuana as in fashion of the 60s. It was more than that for John Lennon. Cynthia Lennon would report that in the prior years that John would bring home strangers that he met at clubs to continue partying, um, that all engaged in the counterculture of the time and the drug culture. John Lennon would qualify, I think, as having an addiction to drugs during this period opiates and later daily alcohol use when he had later kicked opiates during the lost weekend, post kind of abstaining from the heroin use, it was reported that he never took heroin intravenously. John's son, Julian, which he was already disconnected with as a child, had just turned five in April of 68. So a very young five, and he was losing his father. He probably really never had. Julian would be a major focus here in the video, given the topic of generational trauma, parenting, and parents behaving narcissistically, which is really kind of what this channel is about. It's difficult to account for all the other players in this little family's life around them, such as Cynthia going to Greece with the Beatles employee and his family. There were managers, there were drivers, there were roadies, bandmates, families, other rock stars kind of involved in their orbiting around their life around them. Part of that was the three other Beatles and essentially a huge sprawling kind of chaotic company that had just started. And that company, Lennon would describe it as almost like a Rome, like a Roman empire that was in danger if he was going to be leaving the Beatles because it would all fall apart, which isn't that far from the truth. Um, meaning his, his, you know, later leaving the Beatles meant disaster for managers, employees, hangers on. There were a lot of people involved in their lives and the Beatles had this multi-armed company called Apple LTD that had just been formed in January of 68. So it's all of this stuff is very fresh to this moment. The Beatles longtime manager and what seemed to be the glue to them, Brian Epstein, had passed away approximately nine months earlier to May of 1968. 
And that put the Beatles into somewhat of a self-management role and chaotic kind of thing until Alan Klein, a manager, took over in 1969. That added more tension inside the Beatles. Lennon and others would qualify that when Brian Epstein died, that's really the true kind of breakup or the end of the Beatles. An example of that chaos around the Fab Four with the company and its entourage is in June of 68, James Taylor, who was recently signed to Apple Music, they had just started this label, he was one of the first people they signed, and he would go to England and start recording this album, and he would share opiates with Lennon. Taylor didn't start him on the opiates, but just a window into the day-to-day -day life with the film projects or gadgets, labels, musicians, and probably a lot of other hangers-on, and also beloved staff that was there from the beginning, like Neil Aspinall and Mal Evans. Alan Klein would fire all original Apple employees in 1969, of which the Beatles would fight him on it to kind of save some of these ones, such as in the case of Aspinall and Mal Evans. You could see clips of Mal Evans, a roadie, kind of being ever-present in the studio. He has a, a tragic ending, which is really, really sad. A week after this incident between Cynthia and John and Yoko, in May of 1968, the Beatles would start the White Album after hitting an even newer heightened success from their last album, Sgt. Pepper, released exactly a year earlier on May 26, 1967, Into the Summer of Love. During that time of this incident, Lady Madonna had been released in March of 1968 and stayed in the UK charts for about eight weeks. March would also bring four Grammys for Sgt. Pepper. There had been some travel to India to study with the Maharashi. Hello Goodbye had hit number one back in January. May 22nd, 1968 is also the date listed as John and Yoko making their relationship public. Cynthia would witness that in her home in the AM and then see the announcement in the papers of John and Yoko's couplehood later. This also marks an intense love affair with Yoko and Lennon in a new pattern of her being present with him everywhere he went, including in the studio. So that's some context of what was going around them at the time. In this moment where Lennon is out publicly, and I would say provocatively with his affair with Yoko Ono and sending a passive, not so passive aggressive message to Cynthia, um, the coming divorce would continue kind of in a bizarre and dramatic nasty chain of events with John filing for divorce and accusing Cynthia of infidelity and sending the message of divorce through the Beatles character that I mentioned earlier, Magic Alex. Magic Alex is an engineer and employee of Apple who George Harrison would describe as not very magical. He's more of a kind of a fraud, possibly a grifter who is enmeshed in the Lennon divorce in this really awful way. In short, John encouraged Cynthia to go to Greece on a holiday with Magic Alex and his family since the Beatles would be busy making the White Album, and Cynthia would make the mistake of sleeping with Magic Alex on the 23rd or thereabouts. After a night of drinking, she'd just find out this thing with John and Yoko, and he had urged it despite having his own wife in the same home. So it was just this really big mess, and Cynthia Lennon would qualify it as a massive mistake she, since she never really liked the man to begin with. Madras would later be Lennon's messenger to Cynthia, informing him that Lennon was suing her for divorce on the, on the grounds of infidelity. Um, if he can process all that, given, you know, what was going on. And then Madras stated he would be a witness in support of Lennon to Cynthia. So you, you kind of can't make this stuff up. It's like he's really behaving as this sycophant, really. And, uh, you know, and John's pulling the strings and manipulating all that. Um, some trauma survivors grow up in similar immature messes where the adults are acting out to their earlier trauma with severely limited boundaries and self-righteousness and all kinds of stuff. And it makes me think of like the chaotic communal living or, or like cult living at the time in the counterculture where the wheels had come off the train so hard that it's just, it's hard to comprehend. So I'd like to shift now into maybe thinking about we have a time machine, what would an intervention with John Lennon maybe look like? So back in our time machine and given all that, let's say someone challenged John Lennon and recommended a session with somebody like a therapist about his current situation. What would that look like? If somebody kind of said like, hey man, you, do you really wanna be doing all this right now? Maybe somebody close to him who was concerned about the mess that was unfolding. And we can hear that in Paul McCartney's Hey Jude that others were aware of, but I think in the world of rock stars and at the time period or whatever, even now, people don't fully intervene because it's really hard to. Um, and as a side note about Hey Jude, about Lennon's music, this is hard to say. I don't want to take the meaning 
away from songs away to people, but these songs are life changing in many ways. But at the same time, like just take Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. It's like he wrote this beautiful song about one of his son's drawings. But again, it's hard to reconcile. He wasn't even connected with the with his son enough. And, you know, as songwriters, it's just they're constantly doing it. They're looking for that inspiration. I wonder what it's like for Julian, for people to love Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And it's like, oh, you had such an amazing relationship with your dad and he was inspired and he knew you in that way. And, and that's the opposite of what happened. So again, it's like separating the art from the artist is going to be tricky, especially if the songs go to your heart like they, they go to my heart. By intervening, I mean like the sad disintegration of an already struggling family, there was a need of some damage control. And as a side note to damage control, which was something that Brian Epstein was actually really good at, as we see later when John Lennon's father reappeared in his life. Um, the damage control was rooted in the Beatles' public image. And going forward, especially from Lennon, and the other three Beatles would have to answer for John Lennon's behavior to others. So I'm not saying Brian Epstein's approach was healthy. That was often like a offense-defense approach to journalists and stuff. I'm not even saying it's even noble. What I'm saying, there didn't seem to be anyone to check Lennon at the time to look at his consequences in his personal life. And every Beatle had to deal with press in a 24-7 in, in in kind of way. And let's hypothetically say that if a client, li in the same circumstance as John Lennon presented in my office, without obviously being a Beatle, the aggressive acting out could have been curbed a little bit by, and the damage possibly lessened by getting the client to be less triggered about the whole thing, less self-righteous. Um, and look at the things that was coming up in that potential divorce around Julian and Yoko and the pressures going on around him. To at least ask, you know, if you want out of your marriage, just maybe gracefully exit instead of going to war and acting out and causing lifelong damage to a child. I mean, I'd be more, you know, careful on how to couch that. Um, what would obsession have potentially have looked like around May of 1968 for him? And please don't take this as like, oh, I'd fix him real good. <laughs> this is armchair psychology. I'm giving him a, I'm just giving you a window into my thoughts of working with a client who would be experiencing a similar trauma response, which would be the fight response. And the tendency for many childhood trauma survivors to bottle things up and then blow things up and go to a place where it's like you're dead to me from now on kind of stance like the stance that he took with Cynthia. And I say this from even personal experience. I've been guilty of this in my relationships. Perhaps the presenting problem of someone coming into a session like that would be dealing with how to execute kind of a divorce and the stress that comes with all that. There are many ways to leave a marriage and with this, the way he did it possibly being one of the worst ways to go about it. You know, he could have benefited from some guidance and away from his kind of scorched earth kind of behaviors and how he went about it. A therapist might be curious about why not exit the marriage more respectfully and gracefully, like I mentioned. And trauma survivors don't like that. They, we don't like our minds to be changed if we're convinced of something. Um, why not establish a relationship with your son who is just watching you kind of walk away and already not trusting you given what you're like with your moods, your irritability. Lennon was emotionally abusive to Julian Lennon even by that time. Why push the boundaries of being so provocative in your new marriage and be so open with your new lover? What is that about? You know, realistically, I don't think he'd be in a place to both be able to express what was going on or take in that kind of feedback. Hallucinogenic drugs and drugs in general or even harder drugs, puts you in a place of kind of detachment and kind of fantasy world where nothing really matters. And that would have compounded a lot of things, but not really the root cause, which would have been the childhood trauma. In many ways, this kind of you know intervention probably wouldn't have been productive with someone living in the haze of excessive LSD use along with other substances. I imagine that Lennon wouldn't want to talk about how he was handling his family life. I see him like a teenager kind of acting out in this relationship stuff, being highly anxious, self-righteous, and avoidant about it, like with the messages that he did with this guy, Magic Alex, and how we handle things in the divorce, sending messengers, you know. In reading about Lennon, and given what I do, it appears to me that he simply displays common PTSD, CPTSD symptoms manifesting in projection, rage, depression, poor self-soothing, self-righteousness, and poor interpersonal insight. 
you know, he seems to have been punishing those close to him for crimes that don't quite add up, which is really a telltale sign of childhood trauma. This is a common trait that childhood trauma survivors have, and it's wrapped up in bitterness and projection. So, and he was in love with Yoko Ono, and they were in love together, and I believe that she supported him as new lovers do in this kind of, it's you and me against the world kind of approach. And they may have enabled each other in the, in the kind of brazen out with things as kind of radical artists. Um, they may have actually manipulated each other as well in their own kind of intoxication with each other. And I wonder if Lennon's acting out in the divorce and causing that damage is rooted in kind of denouncing the confines of being a Beatle or denouncing conservative British culture that he was raised in, like in a resentment. Um, you know, he was raised in that, but he was never fully on board with that stuff. Or a beloved celebrity in kind of hiding much of his independent and creative mind within the Beatles, such as his connection to atonal music that he had that connection with Yoko Ono about in art. Some other factors of this hypothetical situation in terms of emotional maturity. In 1968, John Lennon was just 28 years old. We kind of see him as an older character and we don't really think about his age. He had been a megastar, well beyond the level of Elvis. Elvis, selling more than 35 million records than he did in five years, you know. He was married to Cynthia Lennon at 21, right when the Beatles were picking up, playing a gig right after their ceremony, which was more of really an elopement given neither family approved of the marriage, especially John's aunt Mimi, who raised him, who also raged at him over that marriage over the phone. He was also just 23 when his son Julian was born at the start of Beatlemania in 1963. I don't think I knew how to write a check when I was 23. Would he have been a good candidate for therapy intervention or at least get him to be more grounded about how he was treating his family? Not really. Would he have wanted to explore his feelings around his actions? And in my experience, getting a highly triggered self-righteous trauma survivor who was engaged in substances, let alone immersed in worldwide fame and now falling in love with somebody. While I don't have experience in working with celebrities, you know, the outcome doesn't look too good, but that doesn't negate the need of help. This may have sounded callous to a childhood trauma survivors who are triggered, it isn't meant to be. I'm saying when a survivor is activated in their trauma, we go to what Eckhart Tolle would describe as being in the pain body. It's very difficult to help them see when they're in it. You know, no one likes to question, hey, are you maybe triggered right now? It's actually the most difficult part of being a childhood trauma therapist, and John Lennon is acting out from his past and making it to be all about the present when there are definitely some stressful things going on in his presence, such as Beatlemania and all kinds of stuff going on, but not all the upset belongs in the present. It's very difficult to get somebody to see that. And I know this hypothetical session and the time machine thing, and they're bananas, you know what I mean? We can't fully predict, we can't fully know. I'm just giving you my two cents on what I see with my own clients. Lennon would actually get to therapy two years later for that time that he spent in primal scream therapy it was brief but it had a big impact on him and despite a horrific childhood john lennon was highly sensitive and highly insightful in the right age and in the right circumstances so now i'd like to explore his childhood with you tricky to take all this in so here it goes so he was born on the 9th of october 1940 in liverpool to julia and alfred lennon Liverpool at the time during World War II was a major target during the Battle of Britain. It's the second most strategic target to the Germans due to its shipping and industry. The day he was born, there was an air raid. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that. John was named John after his grandfather and musician Jack Lennon. Also, his middle name of John Winston Lennon was named after Winston Churchill, a very beloved kind of figure at the time around 1940, the prime minister during the war. And he'd later changed this name for his disdain that he had for Winston. Julia Stanley, John's mother, was the youngest of five sisters. And many would describe her as bohemian, immature, beautiful, vivacious, fun. And in my reading, I kind of gathered that she might have been a family scapegoat. And I don't really have the backstory on the Stanley so much. And this is a directly in contrast to the her oldest sister, Mimi, or I believe her name was Margaret, um, who would become John's guardian and raise him in a proper home. And this rift is a major source of John's childhood trauma. There is a marked power dynamic between Julia and her older sister, who is very dominating Mimi. 
yet they also had closeness and friendship. Julia's family were highly critical of her in general, especially her being drawn to men uh, improperly and take that how you, however you like, but it is Britain pre-World War II. The 30s, the Stanleys were highly focused and preoccupied with what they thought to be Julia's immoral and irresponsible behavior. Alfred Lennon, John's father, was a merchant marine and also like kind of worked restaurant-like service jobs and wanted to be an entertainer like his father before him, Jack Lennon. Alfred was orphaned to a Liverpool orphanage around the age of seven-ish, around 1919, um, with, along with a sister around his age after his father, Jack, passed away and his mother, Polly, couldn't manage all the children. Noting here the generational trauma of the Lennon men in the family and abandonment. Alfred and Julia eloped in 1938, defying her parents, who forbid them to cohabitate together improperly. And she went home on the wedding night back to her family. He went home back to his boarding house and was at sea the next day. This has an eerie similarity to how John and Cynthia Lennon sort of had their wedding night as well, with him having a gig that night. Eventually, you know, Alfred Lennon moved in, went to the Julius, into Julia's family and had had no real prospects, and he eventually found work on ships during the war. George Stanley, Julia's father, and John's grandfather was highly against Freddie Lennon, and the family had a lot of contempt for him. And I imagine Alfred Lennon being overly charming kind of person of lower station and not really having all that good potential as a provider. And there are truths to this. You can picture, you know, the patriarch Stanley's position, you patriarch of four sisters who all had disdain for Freddie Lennon. And in modern standards, he wouldn't have been someone who, who was good at keeping jobs or focusing on them because he wanted to be like, say, on The Voice. He wanted to be an entertainer. And he resented these jobs, I believe. And Julia seemed to be very similar to Freddie Lennon in the way, but at least she played ukulele and banjo. Freddie Lennon, you know, he seemed to have an image sure desire for fame and adulation that I would sort of see as sort of a direct result from him, him being abandoned and ending up in an, in an orphanage. Um, Freddie tried to tell people he was a ship entertainer when in reality he was like the waiter on the ship. Both Julia and Alfred came to be seen as like family disappointments. You know, they both loved music. They both, they had romantic sensibilities. They were really irresponsible by many standards but not totally devoid of sense or morality. Both were described as fun-loving, big dreamers. It seemed like the couple were dysfunctional individuals, not billed for wage-based, you know, consistent daily functioning, but aren't we all? <laughs> um, in a similar way, John Lennon also wasn't built or meant for a traditional way of life either. And his Aunt Mimi and Uncle George would raise John Lennon from the age of five right up until his leaving to go to Hamburg, Germany in that early version of the Beatles where they started to do their craft and really become a band. So there was biological parents and then an aunt and an uncle who stepped in to become actual parents under very difficult and kind of really tricky circumstances. So let me explain that in a timeline of John Lennon's life in his first, say, five to six years. So again, born October 9th, 1940. His father, Freddie, wouldn't meet him for the first time for up until a month after his birth when he returned from sea. Aunt Mimi would say that she ran through dodging air raid shrapnel and bullets when there wasn't an actual air raid at the time of his birth. So there's some tall tales that come from Aunt Mimi. John Lennon's first home was his grandfather's home, the Stanleys, where Julia was raised, and she and Freddie didn't have any means, and they weren't yet set up as a couple yet. And John, he'd lived there with extended family who had contempt for his father and who also didn't approve of his mother. So that kind of energy in his really in his infancy and toddlerhood. Um, Julia devoted herself to John in the first two or three years of his life, living with her parents. Freddie Lennon worked consistently as a merchant marine and sent money consistently during this time period. And this time period is up until like around 1943, 44. Around that time, Freddie was listed AWOL in the Merchant Marines, which is sort of like a quasi-military, you know, like economic portion of the UK. And he was listed as deserted from the Merchant British Navy. Due to a ship employment mix-up, he deserted that ship and found himself without pay and deported to Ellis Island. He found another ship and headed for the Middle East and got into some trouble on that ship broaching cargo. 
All Julia would know of this is the paycheck stopped. And around this time period, Julia would frequent pubs and dances and bring John Lennon sort of back home some treats that were hard to find that we'd have for his breakfast, like chocolate and that kind of a thing. And I was wondering as I was reading that, who was minding John Lennon when she was out? I'm, I'm assuming someone, I hope somebody was home. Um, Julia had this lifestyle of being you know, out there socially and dancing and drinking long before she met Freddie. There was a letter from Freddie Lennon giving Julia permission to go out and have fun in his absence, but perhaps he didn't quite know that she would take him up on that permission. Um, Freddie would write to them, and as a toddler, John Lennon would be read these letters and creating this kind of magical aura around Freddie. Julia, still married, got involved with a Welsh soldier named Taffy Williams. They became lovers and she became pregnant, and this is the second man in John's brief life so far. Freddie Lennon returned. Julia claimed that she was raped, kind of in this now feeling like she was in trouble. Freddie confronted Taffy, but the story didn't quite line up, and Freddie had accepted that they had been actually been lovers for a long time. Still committed to trying to make the marriage work, Freddie took John, who was about three years old, to his brother's home where Julia was in the late stage of her pregnancy to give her space in order for her to have just have the child. Julia still didn't want reconnection with Freddie, and she had the baby in secrecy from John. He wasn't aware of this, and Julia's father refused to house her, now with the child out of wedlock, and the baby girl named Victoria was born and given up for adoption immediately. Aunt Mimi had helped Julia find housing during the pregnancy and birth. Now it's about, John is about four years old. Julia returned to Liverpool kind of nightlife after having that baby and wondering about her struggles with addictions or alcohol, just curious about that. She met somebody named Bobby Dinkins and started an affair with him and moving into his apartment with him. This is the third man in John's life, still four. Dinkins was handsome and violent and a drinker. John would recall in the early years of being in Mimi's care that Julia would show up in a black coat with her face bleeding from domestic violence with Dinkins. Um, but Julia was very committed to making this relationship work. I think when there's so many failures, sometimes people really kind of dig into things and try to make something work. And John was shuttled around the Stanley aunts frequently. Mimi would recall John running away from the violence from Dinkins and showing up at her door, and he's about five, it's very hard, cowering in tears and unable to speak. Um, and this was a huge clue into his childhood trauma, specifically around abandonment and rage. The family reported that Julia was odd and really immature, that she was not fit for motherhood or any sort of domestic life. And she kind of make fun of cleaning, make fun of cooking, and just kind of put whatever things together that didn't really make sense at all. Mimi had eventually called child services and the primary complaint being that John was sleeping in the same bed as Julia and Dinkins. Dinkins seemed to be always at odds with Julia for having John around. It was like a narcissistic supply thing or something like that. Mimi was granted full custody of John, which was necessary, it seems like, but it can also look like kind of a power play from a highly strong-willed older sister disgusted with her younger sister. Both things can be true there. In 1946, the loose ties to Freddie were cut completely in an attempt to perhaps maybe rescue John from the turmoil that he saw his son in or get revenge. And he convinced Mimi to allow him to take John to a place called Blackpool. You can think about Blackpool as like an American Atlantic City that was about an hour and a half from Liverpool North. But he actually had intentions of stealing John away for a new life with him in New Zealand. Julia and Dinkins went to Blackpool feeling that something was up and not trusting Freddie. And there was a confrontation with Freddie and Freddie eventually told John he needed to pick between him or his mother. It's up to a five or a six year old to make that decision. John initially chose Freddie because hey, he kind of liked him. He had been malnourished for having a father in his life. Maybe, you know, Freddie kind of crafted this charismatic thing, but eventually as Julia walked away, John followed her and that was kind of the end of it. He, the boy couldn't tolerate all of that separation from his mother, rightfully so. So Freddie Lennon exited their life and became estranged until showing up at the Beatles headquarters in 1964, around 17 or 18 years later. 
Um, John would show signs as of destructive behavior in around the age of kindergarten, but things would kind of balance out in terms of stability at Mimi's and more of a normal childhood resumed with John feeling connected to Mimi and her husband, George. I think his name was George Too Good Smith, like really lovable kind of character. Now let's fast forward from the age of five, leaving for Hamburg about another timeline. Julia lived nearby and would frequently visit John at Mimi's. There's a kind of an odd arrangement kind of going on there. John would later say as an adult that his mother couldn't handle him, which is a common childhood trauma assumption of the individual that there was something wrong with him rather than what is wrong with the adult. That's how children think, and it stays with us into adulthood. Aunt Mimi was really Julia's opposite, super conservative. John wasn't allowed to have a record player, but he fell in love with 50s rock and roll over Radio Europe using a transistor radio. And there was this discrepancy in the history about who helped John buy his first guitar, with Mimi saying in interviews that she broke down and reluctantly got him one, but then in other reports, it was Julia who lent him the money in secrecy because Mimi wouldn't have allowed it. And as a, hold on to that, you know, as a teen, Julia would teach John banjo chords and somehow translated those to guitar, and this would later need to be corrected and as he would learn more traditional guitar chords. So she gifted him and started the instruction of music. Julia would also host John's friends in his early skiffle days of starting to be like a little band of teenage musicians and letting them listen to records and rehearse music and rehearse in their bathroom in the bathroom because they like the echo and smoke cigarettes. Um, and she is what some therapists would call the more popular parent with poor boundaries just kind of one of the game. It really kind of fit into kind of Julia's personality. As an adolescent and teen, John would be somewhat of a leader in his friend group and was capable of being nasty, capable of being a bully, not a very good student. Um, he was highly creative or not, I wanna take that back, it was not that he was a bad student, just wasn't doing the right things that like benefited him. He was highly creative, highly gifted at music and drawing. But at the age of 14, George Smith, Mimi's husband and beloved kind of father figure to John, suddenly died. Smith had given Lennon his first instrument, which was a harmonica. And for a long period of time, John Lennon wore his uncle's coat, his sports coat, kind of in remembrance of him. And tragically, when he was 18 years old, Julia Lennon, now even more connected with her son by introducing him to music and sort of really kind of becoming closer, she horrifically died by getting hit by a car. A friend of John who had escorted Julia on a walk home the night that she was struck, um, he, when he departed from her at this kind of intersection, she was immediately struck no more than probably less than a minute later. John treated this friend with contempt and anger, kind of blaming him for the mother's past, the mother's horrific ending, uh, showing that it's kind of how he dealt with emotions around the age of 18. And it's a sign of being punitive to others uh, when it comes to things outside of his control, it's another symptom that I see. Three years later, John would lose a very close friend to him, Stuart Stuckliff, one of the original Beatles, to a brain hemorrhage just after leaving the Beatles to dedicate his life and his work to art. So moving on to my analysis. Here, I'd like to attempt to kind of correlate John Lennon's childhood trauma with his relationships around this 1968 incident. You know, the timeline summary of Lennon's childhood and development through his teens would involve abandonment, neglect, domestic violence, disorganized caregiving, many changing of hands, you know, potentially witnessing his mother being beaten by Dinkins, and definitely saw the results of after being separated from her and the extended family kind of possibly scapegoating her. Small children can't name these things, but feel them. Terror, separation from the father figure, strife between his mother and an aunt of family, poor boundaries modeled by Julia via neglect, rigidity and control by his aunt, followed by kind of an anything goes kind of freedom with his mother, who is an inconsistent and has multiple changing men in her life in the early years. He's also being put in an impossible position of choosing between his parents and lack of mental health care for a bright and somewhat kind of now disorganized young child and rightfully kind of becoming aggressive at times, you know? Um, just like, not rightfully, but just a common symptom. You know, he would also witness his mother not being respected or being respectable, as well as his father walking out of his life 
um, after an attempt at stealing him away from everyone he knew at the age of five. While this is significant trauma, John was still much loved and cared for about um, inconsistently by his immature mother, Julia, and consistently by his Aunt Mimi and Uncle George. Aunt Mimi was highly rigid, and they would actually frustrate each other as John was also very strong-willed, but they would also find themselves actually laughing hysterically at their breaking points with each other in this kind of power struggle that they would have. And I say this because many things are true in a person's history. It's not really one or the other, but there are situations and issues that lead to CPTSD generational trauma. And clients who have grown up in similar circumstances have an array of CPTSD symptoms, but had John Lennon presented as just a regular client and not a beetle, he would have had a sharp wit, his acidic sarcasm, his buried rage that came out sideways onto people that he was close with, um, and his somewhat kind of brokenhearted lack of faith in people, I think, which would cause him to lash out and cut those close to him, would all kind of make sense to me about how he would treat other people. I'm not dismissing it, I'm just saying I would, I would understand why it's there. So a child growing up in that could easily have grown up into a resentful adult who despised phoniness or hypocrisy um, or poor integrity in others, struggled with being vulnerable and, and struggled with shame. The unconscious disgust thing with phoniness or hypocrisy, such as with Freddie Lennon, uh, was most likely intensely compounded by maybe Beatles fame. From the age of like 22, everyone around you had an angle and wanted a piece of you or your success or have access to you on some level. Um, an example of that disgust in people was compounded by John's life when Freddie reappeared in his life suddenly after the Beatles were on top of the world in 1964 while they were filming A Hard Day's Night. This is a difficult story when you think about the narcissistic parent and what seems to be a highly narcissistic parent behavior. Uh, Freddie Lennon went to the Beatles office with a journalist with him. Think about that, came in, came in it with a journalist in the circus of it, you know what I mean? Like making a scene of it, or did that journalist kind of serve as some kind of, you know, like some kind of lawyer ball kind of a thing, you know? Um, Brian Epstein, who was constantly managing inflammatory stories around the Beatles, such as a later statement when John said that the Beatles felt like they were bigger than Jesus. He sent a car for John to come to the office because his father was there. The meeting just lasted 20 minutes with John just kind of saying, what do you want? And Agreements were made about what was gonna to go to press and what was not, and John eventually kicked his father out of the office. John hadn't seen his father since the Blackpool incident 17 years or so, and why did Freddie come back into his life in that fashion with a journalist with him after the Beatles reached that much fame and claiming that he didn't know his son had become a Beatle, even though that Lennon's name was was the name in the UK at the time. So there's no way he could have not have known. There were more appearances of Freddie, such as showing up at Kenwood at John's estate, with Cynthia kind of taking him in and giving him a haircut. You know, uh, some attempts were made at reconnection between the two, but they just kind of didn't work. Freddie Lennon would release a single later called That's My Life, My Love and My Home in 1965. And it's extraordinarily hard to not see this as an estranged narcissistic father attempting to kind of ride coattails or cash in on his son's success using the family name. John Lennon was really disturbed by this and he asked Brian Epstein to do his best to squash the release in the charts on radio and otherwise. It's reported and the single was suddenly removed from the charts as it seemed to gain traction. Um, back to the time machine of the date of his first marriage and walking out of his son Julian's life and Cynthia's life, it has some a spooky recapitulation of generational trauma in John's childhood. Julian was just five and nearly exactly the age John Lennon was when he stopped seeing his father, Freddie, which he already saw very little of to begin with. It's kind of uncanny. Julia's immaturity and lack of personal accountability in managing her marriage with Freddie Lennon was also sort of a scorched earth, hurtful undertone like we see in how John ended his marriage with Cynthia. Freddie Lennon had a great capacity to be manipulative and callous around how he manipulated Aunt Mimi to take John on that Blackpool holiday and not thinking about what stealing him to New Zealand would do to him or Julia or, or his life or everyone around him. Who was that plan to go to New Zealand for? Was it for revenge? 
Was it for Freddy? Was it for John? The boundary issue here is that Freddy was almost a stranger in his son's life, given his prior absence. This aligns with John's poor consideration and poor boundaries of having a new lover in his home while his wife is present crossing that line. Also crossing the line that Julia crossed by starting things before others had finished, such as starting a relationship with a man while she was still married. Julia also potentially modeled fast connections of introducing new men in her life to John as a child without him having any process to that. John Lennon's childhood is also rooted in this belief of like kind of winners and losers, good people and bad people. With Mimi, I think, possibly cultivating like a rescuer dynamic from the perpetrator who is Julia and John being the victim. This is known as a Cartman drama triangle, which is helpful to kind of think in a formula about how dysfunctional relationship motives, you know. Well, what I'm saying there is, again, I think Aunt Mimi really crafted this narrative that she was a savior. And don't get me wrong, John's care was very much needed from Mimi, but interviews make it seem like Mimi was really invested in the story of her rescue of John. It was Mimi who dodged shrapnel in the air raid when there wasn't any that evening, and um, it actually happened earlier that day. It was Mimi who bought him his first guitar, while other reports say that it was Julia. Julia funded it, John went and go got it, and kind of hid it from Aunt Mimi. In the Lennon divorce, this is complicated, in his relationship with Yoko Ono and his treatment of Julian, there's another issue going on that Yoko's daughter, Kyoko, was taken away in a custody battle by Yoko's ex. And there's a theme there on who is worthy of rescue and who is not. Um, Julian Lennon and Kyoko are born in the same year of 63, and while Lennon is walking away from Julian, He's assisting in the custody battle and traveling around to rescue Kyoko, um, rescuing one child while abandoning another. That's hard to take in and process. Um, there is another generational theme, such as Yoko's ex, you know, he, he absconded with his daughter Kyoko, just as Freddie Lennon has attempted to do so. Think about that. Yoko's ex stole Kyoko away in a loose custody arrangement. Was that revenge? Who was that for? I can't imagine that Lennon would not have been greatly affected by the actions on Yoko's ex, you know? When Sean Lennon is born in 1975, when Lennon sort of left public world to be dedicate himself to be a stay-at-home father, um, this is something I believe to have been of the good influence of Aunt Mimi, but there's also a sad dynamic, again, about one child being special and one not. If, in regards to how Cynthia Lennon was treated and disrespected emotionally, financially, legally, and dismissed, my mentor Amanda Curtin would ask the question about someone's behavior like that. It's like, oh, I wonder where he learned that from. Um, we can see Julia dismissing and discarding Freddie Lennon, for better or worse, with contempt. After starting a new relationship with Taffy Williams, where she had become pregnant and gave up a baby girl, uh, where did Lennon learn to do this common childhood trauma behavior of destroying someone due to not having the skills or maturity to exit the relationship in a humane way. Also, being cutting and kind of caustic was something Mimi was known to be like. She was known to be someone that you don't cross, was very sharp-tongued, highly dismissive, like with her sister Julia. Again, good people and bad people. I also think there's an added element to Cynthia's abuse at the hands of John, and he was also physically abusive prior to the divorce at one point. You can hear that in some of his songs, I Used to Beat My Woman or something like that. Um, and Cynthia may have represented an element of conservatism to John that totally went against his personality. Mimi tried to mold John into a successful standard middle-class contributing member of society, and that came with a lot of pressure. I'm not excusing John's behavior. I'm just trying to get to sort of like this, where the rage may have, may have come from. It doesn't matter where the rage came from. It's like he's, he was abusive and he could acknowledge that. Um, Cynthia may have been in the firing line and represented that straight lace kind of pressure. In other words, in a session with Lennon, I might've asked him, does all his disgust and contempt belong to Cynthia? trying to get him to recognize that he's triggered and not knowing how to exit without being harmful. Uh, regarding Julian, who would report that he only saw his father approximately eight times or so between the moment in May of 68 when he walked out to his death at the Dakota in, De in December 8, 1980, 
when Julian was 17. Process that eight times or so. During what is known as the lost weekend of an 18th month separation between Lennon and Yoko Ono, the separation was around, I believe, pressures about being the celebrity of like post Beatle life, but also him, you know, like, um, the separation happened, but but Yoko Ono kind of assigned a young woman named May Pang to look after John. And the separation around John and Yoko was around not getting along amidst constant pressure from the press about, you know, breaking up the Beatles, yada, yada, yada. And for 18 months, Lennon was in LA making recordings, drinking very alcoholically, living kind of a club lifestyle and acting out in violence, such as that heckling incident at the comedy club, at the Smothers Brothers Club. Julian around, I think around 10 or 11 or 12, visited his father in California at the time, but it was at the recommendation of this woman, May Pang, who reported that Lennon really needed some hand-holding about being around Julian or making that connection happen. That's hard to take in. You know, this makes me speculate about other CPTSD symptom of avoidance and shame. I think Lennon knew on some level about his maturity limits on what to do with his son. And he was kind of comforted by Pang's pressure around making that happen or she made it happen. That's really tough. Like putting oneself in Julian's shoes, if I have this right, it's difficult to have, you know, to be doing the visit suggested by a complete stranger, not because your father wanted that connection. I've avoided the silly story that Yoko Ono broke up the family and broke up the Beatles. While her behavior might've been off in some accounts and all that stuff, the Beatles story and the Lennon marriage is way more complicated than that. To understand a little bit about being in a band and group projects, if you've ever had a group project in college or something like that, do you remember hating it? But imagine that that group project was like, your bread and butter. And there was a lot of good that came out of that group project, but it was still a group project. They get old. Nothing really lasts forever in that way. So I know that there's not people kind of still, hopefully there's not still people like still sitting on why did the Beatles break up, but I just wanted to kind of add that in there. It's an old immature thing to say that Yoko Ono did it all when John Lennon was really, you know, he was showing symptoms of complex PTSD and he had some highly destructive behaviors and there's other factors and maybe the other Beatles didn't want to be in a band anymore either. So I know I've possibly contradicted myself here, but I also see Yoko Ono as kind of a manipulative influence as well as a positive influence in his life. The manipulation around the estate planning on how the first marriage ended and how Julian was treated, also sending May Pang to be part of his life during the separation. It's kind of like a separation with an agent planted in his life. It's it's a break without a full break. Cynthia and John were simply highly different people, with Cynthia being more reserved and John having high levels of creativity and openness and a desire to live in kind of a bohemian lifestyle. Uh, Yoko Ono and John had this soulmate connection that can be seen as unparalleled. Um, his first marriage seemed to not be the right fit. And as a side note, the openness is sort of like, you know, John Lennon could experience drugs with Yoko Ono. He couldn't do that with Cynthia. She just wasn't really into that. And it makes me even think about the friendship between Kurt Cobain and David Grohl with one person really into drugs and one person not. There's there's a broken bridge there. There's like, you know, there's there's an in and an out of being in a relationship with somebody if you're not able to kind of go there. For anyone who has the experience of having a drug buddy, I'm, that's what I'm trying to say, if you have that in your history. Another issue is that Freddie Lennon did put in effort in an attempt to make things work with Julia, despite her already being pregnant with another man's child. Um, he did try at family and then try to maintain fatherhood with John, but then, you know, many things can be true at the same time. Freddie was kind of Machiavellian when he reappeared in John's life in a really lowly way, but one could look at as him as someone who was tossed out of fatherhood, and then he kind of gave up on reconnecting or connecting and connected in a terrible way, which is the other side of him. John Lennon and Yoko Ono went to therapy. They went to primal scream therapy to work on child issues, but he didn't really stay in it for very long. I know it's now complicated with sort of the presence and travel of it from what I understand about it now. And it seemed like John and Yoko, this couple in the late 60s and 70s, moved from situations that interested them very kind of frequently. They were That was their lifestyle. And it's reported that Lennon left therapy with Arthur Janoff saying that he knew himself better than anyone could just after four months I believe he was greatly affected in the positive way by therapy, but it's just really a drop in the bucket clinically, so to speak. I believe he would have benefited to staying in longer and work on things like sort of the history of drug abuse, the rage, the vulnerability. 
And reading and listening to interviews, I really strongly suggest if you're interested in this is to really take in, it's like, it's a long interview, but his last interview is, is really powerful before his tragic death. Lennon seemed like he was a really enjoyable person who I think had so much potential to grow more and more as a man in spirit and potentially make amends and connect with Julian. However, Potential, and that maybe being a fantasy of mine, is very different than follow through. He had plenty of time to make things better. In his last interview, it seemed like he was kind of though on his way to growing more and more. Listening to that last interview, he discussed enjoying raising Sean Lennon with the help of say nannies, and it's like 1980, and he, he talks about not letting Sean Lennon watch commercials about sugary cereals or stuff like that or garbage that it's all over TV. So they would watch TV together and he would shut it off during the commercials. Not wanting Sean to be like, oh, I want that, can we get that? And listening to this makes me, um, I started thinking that, you know, this man used to have LSD smuggled into Britain through Film Solution from California and snort heroin. <laughs> and just that's just 12 years prior, I'm not criticizing, but just the juxtaposition of going from that lifestyle to being a dad in that way. I see that as growth and change and again, yet potential for him to have cleaned up his business even more. Then you read about how he would rage at Julian at a young age. And Julian were reported that he stopped smiling and being himself because of how his father just sort of verbally like sort of annihilate him, really would have an abusive impact on his son. That also happened with Sean at some point, the difference being I think that Lennon apologized to Sean. Sean was screened at as well to the point that he needed some medical attention about an ear, it's reported, because his Lennon screaming was so loud. Again, he's a hard character to kind of like get your head around. Lastly, why I say that Lennon may have had more and more potential to keep growing is in his lost weekend and separation from Yoko Ono, who for better or worse was a positive influence in his life, he returned from that alcoholic bender with more insight and embracing more vulnerability with her and becoming a father and a better husband, according to Yoko, which is like impressive, impressed her. One can see this as a man like wrestling out of our current topic of toxic masculinity. Um, into a more progressive, positive masculinity, which was impressive to me, especially given the time. I think he intellectually got it in his in the early 70s with his, his music and supporting feminism, but I don't think it, the rubber really hit the road until after that lost weekend. Despite the dysfunctional aspects, John and Yoko were often ahead of their time, greatly ahead of their time in terms of lifestyle and progressive ideas, you know, except when they were doing heroin together. Lastly, John Lennon packed more into his life in his short 40 years than what is considered humanly possible. Listening to his last interview done just three days before he passed, you can hear his excitement. You can hear his exuberance for life with his wife and with Sean, and as well as kind of he just released this comeback double fantasy record, just released barely three weeks before his murder with some powerful songs on that record as well. Childhood trauma takes a long time to wrestle out of. And it's difficult for an individual to work their way into a new set of values. And I think Lennon was on his way and had that potential again. Julian Lennon was just 17 when his father was murdered after never fully having him in his life or feeling like he mattered to John Lennon. And in more present, you know, kind of base interviews as, as Julian as an adult, you can hear Julian's moving on from his father treatment or his legacy of him with some dignity and grace. John Lennon doesn't define Julian Lennon which thinking of a sort of a survivor's journey in that way. Like many other stories that I hear from clients about abusive parents, one sits with how unnecessary it all was, which I believe is part of accountability and healing in this story. Reconciling would have been the responsibility of John Lennon's when it comes to Julian, and there would have been a lot of damage to clean up along with Cynthia and others in his life, probably such as McCartney. And I believe that they reconciled in a good enough way later, but uh, you know, it's, there's still that capacity for him to lash out at people. So potential, that could very much be just my wishful thinking, but in my work, it is rare to see a toxic parent have insight into their behavior and make changes in their behavior, such as how we did with Yoko and Sean. We can hear it in his music and his writings that John Lennon was highly sensitive, highly in tune with other people. He was incredibly insightful, and that's what's kind of infuriating about him when, he, when we look at his behavior around this time.
And I'd like to think his insight would have grown for him to take risk and address some more of that damage. But again, potential is different than follow through. So I really hope that this podcast was interesting to you. And I would love to hear from you if you have some suggestions about who you would like to see in the series of what happens to men or if simply what happens to women as well or what happens to anybody in their childhood trauma and who they become. And I'd love to hear from you. Uh, You're welcome to contribute to the channel via my Patreon. You're welcome to consider joining my monthly healing community membership. It's a subscription service where we meet twice a month for live Q&As. There's e-course work, all of it available to you, as well as weekly journaling prompts on inner child work and reparenting from childhood trauma. And as always, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. And may you be joyous. And I would like to say, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. Thank you.